Support for this Financial Times podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully, so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash FT. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Alpha Chat, the business and economics podcast from the Financial Times. This is the Who Gets to Live in Superstar Cities Anyways edition. I'm Amy Keene. On the show today, Cardiff hands over the mic and I talk to Richard Florida, an urbanist, professor, and author of The Rise of the Creative Class. And he has a new book out that illustrates just how urban equality has evolved over time. We talk about his critics, the forces he says are shaping geographic inequality, and much more. Here it is. Richard, thanks for being on Alpha Chat. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. So before we get into the subject of your book, The New Urban Crisis, uh, I think it's important that we lay out the foundation of much of your research and your public work so far. And that's this idea of the creative class and the sort of economic growth that the creative class has brought and, and will bring to cities. As U.S. and other Western nations transition from manufacturing to knowledge-based economies, the clustering of these knowledge workers, as everybody knows, has become ever more important. And in your book, I think it was back in 2002, actually, The Rise of the Creative Class, you wrote that the places that will thrive are those Mm -hmm. with the highest velocity of ideas, the highest density of talented and creative people. You know, these people encompass tech workers, finance, lawyers, even healthcare. So the return of these people to to urban settings, well-paid, educated workers, that's going to spark a kind of economic growth in our cities. Is that more or less correct? Yeah, it's exactly correct. We're going through what I think is probably the biggest economic transformation in human history. For all human history before us, we created wealth through physical labor. For much of that history, you know, we either hunted and gathered or we created wealth by building agricultural communities and really working on the soil or working with, you know, props and farm animals. And then, you know, a few hundred years ago, beginning in in Europe and England then in the United States, we developed industry, textiles, steel, automotives. But still, you know, as as Karl Marx or the classical economists would have reminded us, we still used this. That's what the proletariat, you know, cranky old Marx in the British Museum, um, you you know, created wealth exploited by the capitalists by by using their physical labor. And the important point to note in this is, is that's how I grew up. I was born in Newark, New Jersey, which that fact should help people understand my ideas pretty well. My dad only had a seventh grade education. We we're kids of Italian immigrants. And he worked in a factory in the ironbound section called Victory Optical. So as a boy, you know, I saw two things happen. I saw Newark decline and burst into racial riots and go up in flames. And I saw my dad's factory where he worked. You know, and sometimes on the weekend he would take me there if I begged him enough. Close. I experienced deindustrialization and urban decline. So that's what I thought, you know, as a kid. Well, that's what you think is happening in cities. Factories are leaving and cities are declining. Um, And when I went off to university, Rutgers University, I I took an urban geography course in which, in fact, we were sitting in the very neighborhood in New York City where I toured with a notebook. You know, it was our assignment to come down here and look around. And it was the 70s or 80s, and there was the urban revival. And I said, oh, God, you know, Lord, not all cities are declining. Some are reviving. I went off to Pittsburgh, and the long story short is – I began to see that our economy was changing, and not just to a knowledge economy. Many other brighter people, Peter Drucker and others, Fitch Malchip, have written about that much more eloquently than I could. But I began to see that the platform for the knowledge economy wasn't just the industrial corporation, which all of them said, you know, it's going to be these science and technocratic, high-tech. You know, first it was General Electric and IBM, and then it was the high-tech companies like Intel and Apple. And I came to the conclusion that it, the city itself was the platform for bringing together, as you said, as you noted, in these d- dense concentrations and amalgamations and agglomerations of, of talented and creative people. And so the premise of your new book, The the New Urban Crisis, is that, yes, that sort of that return to the city, that meant boom time for the creative <laughs> class in many ways and for other parts of the city, but it also came at the expense of the poor and the working class. A lot of those people were pushed out of the city centers. In some cases, they moved to the suburbs. So we're going to unpack all of this in a minute, get to the sort of meat of the book. But my first question is, 
what happened in the subsequent years that changed? I mean, what, what were the trends that led you to believe that you sort of had to return to this thesis? So, so first of all, since, you know, my books tend to spur debate, and I would say that I, I often say, and I say this in the introduction, I learned the most from my critics, uh, my thoughtful critics from the left and especially from the, the right, because I tend to be more on the left myself. But some people have said, you know, Richard Florida, this is his mea culpa. He's sorry. It's not a mea culpa, and I'm not sorry. And, <laughs> and I mean, I don't mean to say that in an arrogant way. I think, if anything, I underpredicted the extent of the urban revival. If you would ask me in the year 2000 when I was writing Rise of the Creative Class, would we be sitting on Hudson Street in New York City in the Financial Times offices, surrounded by boutique condominiums and upscale restaurants, in a place that was storage facilities and disgusting, <laughs> surrounded by the Holland Tunnel, I would have said, you're from the moon. If you would have told me Pittsburgh would be held up, a city that I love, would be held up as a model of urban transformation. If you had told me that in downtown San Francisco, which I talk about in the New Urban Crisis, there's now more venture capital-backed startups by a factor of three, by a factor of three than the Silicon Valley, which was by far the leader, and that two neighborhoods in San Francisco attract more than billion, billions of dollars in venture capital, I would have said you're insane. If you had told me that New York City would become the number two high-tech hotspot in America, New York City, lower Manhattan, number two to San Francisco only, ahead of the Silicon Valley, if you had told me that Detroit <laughs> would come back and have massive investment in its core and not have enough housing for the people who wanted to live there, if you had told me that Newark, New Jersey, my hometown, would be the headquarters of Audible, not only the headquarters of Audible, that young people I meet, I met the other day, are moving back to Newark, to the neighborhood where my dad's factory was, and that now on my Twitter account, I see, whether it'll happen or not, Newark being thought of as a site for Amazon's second headquarters, I would have said, we're all nuts. Yet all of those things happened. And really, they happened in the wake of, I was trying to anticipate an urban revival and trying to anticipate the movement of this group of talented, ambitious, creative class people who were attracted to cities. But... I would have never guessed. And really, the truth of the matter is, the people who have done, the economists have studied this show, that it's the year 2000 is when it explodes. So I was lucky enough to be able to intuit this and have enough data to talk about it. But I missed, I missed the extent of it. And so what happened in the intervening period is there was such an onslaught of urban revival and transformation. These creative, talented types, and of course, the global super rich, came flooding into cities that it, it really put a lot of pressure on urban land markets. You know, if you have rich people, middle class people, high tech companies, art galleries, the Financial Times, I could media organizations <laughs> all competing for the same space in the same neighborhoods, prices go up. Affordability becomes a real issue and inequality becomes a resultant. So so that's what I think happened. And you know, I began to pick this up. Very early on, you know, I wrote the first essay I wrote on inequality was in 2003 for a publication called the Washington Monthly, where the data showed that it was San Francisco, Austin, Seattle, New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., these, these creative hubs that were the most socioeconomically unequal. But I still think I could not see the depth of this, you know, you know until, and, and we can talk about this more, I mean, I learned this lesson in Toronto which is really not, not the states. I think I learned the lesson about the new urban crisis is when I moved to Toronto in the, in the late 2007 period. This mecca of progressive urbanism, the place that Jane Jacobs, my mentor, moved from Hudson Street, you know, close by, mm -hmm. to Toronto. And seeing Rob Ford, you know, the original populist, the crack mayor become mayor, showed me that if Toronto could be divided, if there could be a populist backlash by by people who felt left out, who were in the suburbs, who could not participate in the urban transformation, who thought it was urban elites that were getting the benefits. He called it the gravy train. So that's when I began this study. And a couple things. One kind of arcane thing, most people who study urban economics study metropolitan areas. That would be myself, the Ed Glazer, the leading urban economist at Harvard, Enrico Moretti at Berkeley, people in London at the London School of Economics, Bruce Katz at Brookings. What, what our industry tended to be was comparing the performance of, of innovation or productivity of metropolitan areas. Urban sociologists, who are not urban economists, had for a long time looked inside cities at the, the disadvantaged neighborhoods. And I met two brilliant urban sociologists uh, by hook or by crook, I got interested. Rob Sampson at Harvard, magnificently, wonderfully astute guy. 
and another young man named Pat Sharkey who teaches at NYU. And, and it was like, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I'm not, a, I'm an urbanist, an urban uh, planner by training, actually, not an urban economist, but I know enough about economic geography to be dangerous. And, and so we had been studying concentrated advantage. They had been studying concentrated disadvantage. And it was like, you could put those two sides of a coin together and get a better explanation. At the same time, we had been, my group had been very optimistic about the urban revival. I called this group the urban optimist. But there was a group of other social scientists and geographers who had been very pessimistic. You know, cities were going to hell in a handbasket. The rich people were driving everybody out. Gentrification was horrible. And I said, maybe I could square these circles, you know. And so, and so that's what I tried to do. I tried to put them together. So to do that, we had to do more microscopic or micro-level research. We had to actually try to map this new geography between metro areas and within them. So with that framework, uh, let's get into the book. The issue of the new urban crisis, the full title is The New Urban Crisis, How Our Cities Are Increasing Inequality, Deepening Segregation, and Failing the Middle Class, and What We Can Do About It. You lay out very cleanly in five forces that are sort of driving this crisis, this problem. First one being these so-called superstar cities. Can you just explain what you mean by that? I think what the book is really talking about, and this first factor specifically, is, is spatial inequality. There's a big conversation about economic inequality and the gap between the rich and the poor. But I think I came to conclude in writing this book is that spatial inequality or geographic inequality is actually the bigger thing. And that's what's behind Brexit. That's what's behind populism. It's not a rich and poor divide. It's a divide between affluent cosmopolitan urban places and places being left behind. So the first dimension of that is the growing gap between places in the advanced countries within them, like the United States and the United Kingdom and across the world. I just hit me one day. All these people talk about winner-take-all societies and winner-take-all economies and LeBron James makes a lot of money and Taylor Swift makes a lot of money and big shot CEOs and entrepreneurs make a lot of money. That we also have winner-take-all cities or winner-take-all urbanism. That places like New York and San Francisco and Boston and Seattle are really capturing the spoils in terms of talent and economic assets. You know, in, in the United States, this is really interesting for folks listening in. We think, oh, my God, there's spatial inequality. New York, San Francisco and Boston are, are really so far ahead in terms of price per square foot or the price of housing or the amount of talent. The top five metros in the United States, New York, L.A., Chicago, Houston, um, Dallas, or Philadelphia, D.C., produce about 25% of GDP. The top five metros in Canada produce 50% of GDP. I think London produces a third of British GDP, and Seoul produces half of Korean GDP. So this winner-take-all urbanism is actually magnified outside the United States. So... So what I talk about in the, is this group of winter cities, London, New York, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, across the world, Paris, San Francisco, of course, Los Angeles, that they really are growing further and further away from the rest of cities in their own countries. They're almost like, you know, Tom Friedman said the world is flat. And I think the world is flat. I, I say the world is spiky, but it's flat on two levels. The peaks, the spiky peaks are flat. So someone in London and New York and Hong Kong and Toronto are at this, you know, basically the same level. And then the people in the other cities at the valleys are at the same level. So, so I say the world is spiky. And that I think this spatial inequality or winner-take-all urbanism is the most important and the least understood phenomenon of our time. And I think that's where the populist backlash really comes from. Yeah, what's interesting you wrote is, you know, those sort of the very dense areas, those cities filled with highly educated young people. They've got, in some cases, some of the greatest inequality. They also tend to be the most liberal which is the, the second point, right? Yeah. So, so the new urban crisis is – the old urban crisis was a crisis of urban decay and dysfunction of my city of Newark, the middle class leaving, industry leaving, companies fleeing. The new urban crisis is kind of a crisis of success. As these cities have come back, these winter cities have become so unaffordable. They become increasingly unequal. I say this in the book. I say, you know, the great irony is the most productive, the most innovative, the densest cities, which have – happened not only to elect the most liberal politicians, Sada Khan in London, Bill de Blasio in New York, Eric Garcetti in L.A. Interesting, you know, the places that voted the most for Hillary Clinton were San Jose and San Francisco and then Boston and New York. They also have the most progressive, if you will, political worldviews. 
They're also the most unequal. So there, there's irony on top of irony, contradiction on top of contradiction. And what I say in the book is this is really the great contradiction of capitalism, not just of urbanism, because what I think capitalism is today is an old industrial capitalism. It's urbanized knowledge capitalism. The same force that powers our economic growth is clustering. I call it the clustering force of people and ideas and and technology and universities and assets of all sorts. That same cluster force that drives our economy forward also carves these incredible divides in our societies, uh, which not only separate us, but cause the backlash, the political backlash, the populist backlash, which, which in many ways wants to clamp down on that force of progress. Just to put some numbers to this, one point that really caught my attention was this idea of if you look across cities, how much money does the average worker have left over after paying for housing? You know, if you look at the average worker yep. in a place like San Jose, if you think that's sort of right next to Silicon Valley, very nearby, after housing, the average worker has $48,566 left, okay? In uh, Orlando, Florida, it's just 25000 yep. just a little over 25000 However, <laughs> when you However, s- when you split that average worker figure into three different classes of the creative class, the service class, and the working class, that looks very different. This was a big aha moment for me, and it really came from reading other urban economists who I admire, uh, particularly a guy named Enrico Moretti, who was arguing, and, and sometimes criticizing me, and probably for good reason, that you know high-tech industry of the Silicon Valley short had these marvelous spillover effects, and he quotes a multiplier, which he's right. They create five jobs. For every one tech job, we get five high-paying service jobs. And so, and so he's absolutely right. On average, if you take the median worker, that median worker makes a higher wage. If you take a knowledge worker, a a working class blue collar construction or transport or factory worker, or you take a service worker who works in a cafeteria at Google or the the healthcare or gymnasium, you know, at, at Apple, they all make more money. The average makes more money, the median makes more money, and everybody makes more money. And then I said, I don't know, you know, it's just you get this idea. You don't know where it comes from. What if we split it? What if we took, because we have the occupational data, what if we took the knowledge high-tech workers, one group, we took the uh, blue collars, 20% of the workforce, the 40% in San Francisco work in the knowledge, 20% work in the blue collar, and I don't know, 45% or maybe 50% or something like that do service work, low-paid work, you know, food preparation, food service. And we know that they're all making more than they would make in Tuscaloosa or some, or, you know, Birmingham, Alabama. But what if we looked at what happens after they pay for housing? <laughs> Wake up call, like, bing, hits me right in the side of the head. The knowledge workers got a whole bunch of money left over. It, it might be as much as 50 or 60 or 70,000. I forget the exact figure. But it's a lot, even if they pay for that million-dollar home. The blue-collar and the service worker are creamed. You know, they end up with like a pittance. It's less than 20 grand. And and the more expensive the metro is, the denser it is, the worst. You know, it's like San Francisco, San Jose, New York, do the worst. So while it looks good on average, when you look at the actual divisions in our society, and, you know, we know this by way of anecdote. These are the people who are commuting an hour, an hour and a half, the two hours away because they can't afford housing. So I think that was a huge wake-up call for me when we did that analysis. And to be honest, I'm not sure why we did it. I think it was just one day you wake up and you see some something else right about, and you go, there's another way of looking at it, and I'm kind of lucky. You know, I'm kind of lucky I had that I, that hit me in that, that morning. And just to round out so you, you get a real sense of the sort of difference in inequality in these superstar cities versus sort of the rest of the cities, if you go back to that Orlando figure where I said the average – take home in Orlando was just a little over 25 grand. When you separate it out by class, service workers, you know, it's just under 13,000. Working class is 21,000. It's just so much closer to that average figure. Yes, the creative class in Orlando takes home, I think, about 50. But the average is so much closer to what the service worker and the working class are taking home that that just sort of shows you that very striking difference. The third point that we should get to is just that sort of follows on that, the idea of growing inequality, segregation, and sorting that's happening in every metro. And that brings us to this idea of the patchwork metropolis, which if you could sort of define for us. So yeah, what what here, there's a great, brilliant social scientist at University of Toronto named David Holchansky. People should read his work. It was, David Holchansky did a report. It was called The Three Cities of Toronto. The original city of Toronto had a large middle class, about 70% Three quarters of all people lived in a middle-class neighborhood in Toronto with homes and apartments. 
Actually, the fatigue is almost exactly the same for the United States, our research showed. But over the past 20 or 30 years, that old city of Toronto gave way to two new cities. Now, less than 40% of people in Toronto and about 40% of Americans, and it actually is getting closer to a third, only that live in a middle-class neighborhood. What we're seeing is a division into these small areas of concentrated advantage, small neighborhoods of concentrated advantage, and much larger spans of concentrated disadvantage. The, 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 the upper class has grown a bit. It's this lower group, this poor group, the, the disadvantaged group that's expanded at orders of magnitude. And what's interesting from the point of view of America, where you have good data, I mentioned it's about three quarters in 1970, live in a middle class neighborhood. Now it's about a third, a massive shift. And in 203 of, of about 220 metropolitan areas for which we have data, think about this, 200, over 200 of 220, the middle class has declined in the past 20 years. It's just daunting. And, and so where has it declined the most? The largest, the densest, the most affluent, the most technologically innovative places have seen the biggest decline. And that gets me to this idea of the patchwork metropolis. And, and I try, you know, we made those maps inspired by the Chicago School Sociologist of 100 years ago. And, and some people had said, you know, we're still seeing suburbanization. We have a hole in the donut and rich people in the suburbs. Other people said, no, we have a great inversion. Everyone's moving from the suburbs back to the city, and we're, we're seeing the rich people. And what we found is that it's everything above and beyond. In some places, like New York, the patchwork metropolis is a lot of rich people in Manhattan and parts of Brooklyn, surrounded by poor people in the outer boroughs, and then more rich people in the suburbs, along with more poor people in some of the suburbs. In other places, like Washington, D.C., you have, like, the thing's cut in half, one side is all, or Vancouver, one side is all rich people, the other side is all poor people. In other places, like uh, Detroit or Houston, there still are very few, very affluent. There's some pockets of affluence in the urban core, but it's still mainly in the suburbs. A in Miami or L.A., the affluent people are like strung out along the coastline, you know, in a, like a big line with everyone out in, in a couple of rich neighborhoods around universities in the interior. So it's a patchwork. This idea of city and suburb, rich suburb, poor city, Poor suburb rich city no longer makes sense. It's really a patchwork of this juxtaposition of small areas of concentrated advantage surrounded by much larger areas of concentrated disadvantage. What are the, what are the things that do it? One, there are people who want to be in big cities that are congested. They want to be back to the core. Good jobs are there. A lot of jobs are there. The labor market's thick. Good transport. They don't have to drive. And there's good amenities, not just good schools. But, you know, you see it walking around these strollervilles in New York. There are a lot of children's programs and things, not only for young people to do, but young families to do. Second thing is they go f around universities. You see the influx of people around NYU, or around Harvard Square, around the University of Washington. We can go on and on. Wherever you go, you see these university districts acting as poles. And not just for students, because they're nightlife and they're 24-7. Other companies and startups come in, and, 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 and they go around other think tanks. And they go around natural amenities, you know, where you have a coastline, where you have a lakefront, where you have a waterfront, where you have beautiful parks and greenery. So those are, then there are more, but, but those are the kind of things that are dividing us in this new way. And I think, our, I think this idea of a patchwork of advantage and disadvantage is really the way we have to think about it. No, no longer is it, are we divided city and suburb? It's along these new kinds of dividing lines. And so far, you've mentioned class divisions, class segregation, and separation. But racial segregation is such a big part of this crisis in the U.S. in particular. I mean, you know, I hate saying these things, but you know, when you when you come down to it, you have t populism, which is really a white restoration movement, and it's terrifying in that. I mean, you now see it; the data is clear on it. I'm not just saying these. Uh, you know, I've looked at every study by Gallup, Jonathan Rothwell, all the studies by the great Ron Englehart. Holy God, it's so terrifying. You know, I grew up the civil rights movement and, and all of this. You thought it was gone, but it's not. It's, it's gender. It's race. It's terrifying. But what I had to come to grips with, you know, I'm a white man. Race issues are really hard to grapple with for, for white majority men. Not, not, you just don't want to touch them because they're so charged. But a young woman, African-American woman, reviewed one of my studies, and she said, you know, Florida, you're, it's not nice maps you got there, but that's you're showing a map not only of your classes, you're showing a map of race. So in this book, I try legitimately to grapple with that. Um, and the fact of the matter is that 
whenever we talk about inequality or, or, or economic segmentation, it is highly overlaid with race. And there's a study by Rob Sampson, who I met, which is so disheartening and disturbing, but you have to talk about it. When he looked at gentrification, and, and you know, gentrification isn't a, in, in number terms, the number of ge- neighborhoods that gentrify are not that large. They're a big, it's an emotional issue, but it's not that big in the scope when you look across the whole United States. It's like 5 to 10% of neighborhoods in, in big cities like New York or San Francisco. Uh, uh, 5% of all neighborhoods are, are gentrifying across the United States. Much more likely is neighborhoods are staying poor and they're minority neighborhoods. And what, what Samson showed is that the neighborhoods that gentrify in general, there's exceptions to this, like Harlem, tend to be either industrial neighborhoods, old factory neighborhoods where no one lived, or white working class neighborhoods. His statistic is when a neighborhood becomes more than 40 or 45 percent black, it just stays poor. It says, and and I, I quote other work, my own and others, that show the overlap between not only concentrated disadvantage, but race, you know, it is racially concentrated disadvantage and racially, you know, black concentrated disadvantage and white racially concentrated advantage. So I think the United States is, is un, in somewhat unique in this. Uh, this isn't quite the case in Canada, although there is, or, or the UK, there are racial dimensions. And I'm encouraged. You know, one of the things I'm encouraged by is when I talk to around the country and around the world, and when I talk to younger African American scholars, they're very interested in working with me on this agenda. Once one thing I did find, which I found encouraging, is that communities that had a bigger black creative class that that isn't many. You know, the black creative class is highly concentrated in places like Atlanta or Washington D.C. and a few others. But but if a place had a black better black creative class, a larger black creative class, it had higher rates of upward mobility and much lower rates of inequality. So so maybe part of our strategy could be trying to develop pathways. And one of the things I want to say is when I talk about creative class, I'm not just talking about traditional university education. Many of the entrepreneurs who build great startups are dropouts. And that goes for Gates and Jobs, but, but just regular entrepreneurs. The other thing is I'm talking about artists and musicians and media figures. And, and that's an area you know, where we could really work entrepreneurship, innovation, harnessing creativity. Like I always say, I grew up in a mainly working class white community, but there were so many kids who were entrepreneurial and creative and great musicians and great artists, but they got left behind because they didn't get great marks in school. There might be another way to harness working class or the the creative energy of lower income communities, the African-American community. is isn't the traditional. I mean, of course, we want education and all that. But there's other ways to do this. So, what, But the big, big important thing is those places that had a bigger black creative class, they had higher rates of uh, – lower rates of inequality uh, and, and higher rates of socioeconomic mobility. So that may be something we could push on. So that sort of brings us to the fourth point here, which is this issue is framed as a crisis facing city centers. And that's largely what we've spoken about so far. But the problem in cities is responsible for the changing composition of the surrounding suburbs as well. Well, I mean, I had this colleague at Carnegie Mellon. His name is David Lewis. He's in his 90s now. He's sort of like a Jane Jacobs of urban design. He's a brilliant South African guy. He said to me in the 1980s, you know Florida. You're really smart. You're talking about cities. The biggest crisis we're going to face someday, this is in someday, he said, presciently, is the crisis of the suburbs. The cities like New York, like Boston, but even like Detroit, and he was in Pittsburgh or Newark, they have beautiful buildings. They've not been destroyed. They may have been underdeveloped. They may have been abandoned. They have transport infrastructure, rail lines and subway lines and transits that all convene there. They're going to be rebuilt. And he was right. I mean, the, he, he saw this. They're going to be rebuilt because they have the infrastructure to be rebuilt. He said, go look at one of these suburbs. The houses are sticks. The roads are falling apart. The bridges are falling apart. There's no urban core. There's no transit. He said, this is going to be. This is going to make the urban crisis of of your day, of Newark or Detroit, look like a walk in the park. (laughs) 20 years later, how right he is. And so what we've seen is as the highest 10 percent of income earners have moved back to cities, the lowest 10 percent of income earners have been pushed out. So where are they going to go? Some go to other parts of the city that are poor or disadvantaged or underserved or disconnected by transit. But many of them have pushed out to the suburbs. And uh, the suburbs, they don't have the services. They don't have the nonprofits. They don't have the governmental service infrastructure. They don't have transit connection. You don't have a car. You're stuck in an isolated island. So poverty has grown far faster in the suburbs, and and rates of economic dislocation 
as those industries have declined that move to the suburbs and they've been uh, competed, the automation or globalization, they faltered. So it's very interesting. The suburbs have seen rising crime uh, and they're not equipped to deal with it. Uh, and, and boy, it's just been traumatic. And I think it's very interesting to go back to the fault line. It's almost as if these areas of the suburbs have become the great electoral battleground. Um, the cities tend to go Democrat. The affluent suburbs and rural areas tend to go Republican. It's these really dislocated suburbs which swing. I talk about this in the book. They, they can go either way, kind of just like the place I grew up in New Jersey after my folks moved from Newark, North Arlington. But in this election, they swung heavily for Trump. And, and I think it's because of the economic trauma and the fact that they feel like they've been left behind. So, so the suburbs have experienced this great increase in poverty, this great increase in economic dislocation. And in many ways, when you talk about swing states or swing elections— the elections in the United States today, I don't know exactly the case if this is the case, but I think it might be the case in Europe and some parts of Europe as well because poverty has also migrated uh, to the suburbs, that these are the places that really are critical to kind of the electoral balance. So I, what I'm trying to say in the book is to urbanists, wake up, wake up. The suburban piece of this is really big, and, and we need to think about it. We can't just put our eyes as urbanists on, this, on the urban core I actually think developing an agenda to help rebuild the suburbs could could be a way of 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 making you know a more unified pitch for better and and you know one of the things I talk about in the book not everyone's an urbanist like me I don't know what it is maybe a third of people live in cities and love living in cities and urban areas but even more more than half 50 or 60% live in suburbs and uh, maybe they feel kind of left behind, some of them. Some of them are doing right and living gated communities. You know what I'm saying? They don't care. But these other folks are saying, what about me? And I think that's what happened with Rob Ford. What about me? I'm living in a suburb. I want a piece of the Canadian dream. I want a patch of green. I want a nice house. I want a car. What about me? And people who live in, in rural areas. I think everyone kind of picks the place that suits them. And in a way, maybe urbanists, by thinking about city, 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 this, city, that, myself included, we've kind of lost the constituency that's very much wants to make their places better and needs to. So I think one of the great opportunities here in the future is how do we go about renovating suburbs, making them more walkable, more bikeable, more connected with transit? How do we make them part of, because not everyone, you know, look, if everyone tries to jam into the cities, you think the problem of affordability and inequality is bad now, it's going to get worse. We don't have enough space. So actually connecting our suburbs and building a better kind of patchwork might be a way to build a better urban and suburban or a better future, better metropolitan future. So before we get into the fifth and final factor that you cover in the book, which looks at the looming urban crisis in emerging markets, I just want to talk about how we should be thinking or how you think we can think about the sort of idea of inequality, overall inequality versus geographic inequality. So, you know, if you think if the knowledge economy, if the modern economy relies on clustering, right, if you've got some of these forces that are leading to a more productive workforce. It's beneficial for a huge part of society and the population, but you've got these really stark geographic areas of inequality. How do you sort of wrestle with that? So I think, despite those of us in the punditry and on the left, most people don't think in terms of inequality. They don't think, you know, I'm being left behind. Most people kind of think they want to be in the middle class or get ahead. I think spatial inequality or geographic inequality hits them more viscerally. Like my suburbs sinking, my city sinking. There are a lot of rich people downtown. There are a lot, that downtown area seems to be getting all the goodies. Um, I'm here in Cleveland and the people in San Francisco look like they're doing just fine. I think viscerally our connection to place really hits us. And, and we know it, you know, this is, People vote based on where they live, of course, and, and it overlaps with socioeconomic class. But, but this geographic component has been understudied and underestimated, and by Lord, we've got to pay attention to it. And I really think, you know, if you want to talk about the populist backlash, the political backlash, it is much more spatial than it is class-based in a classical sense. And it's, it's, it's not solely about economics. It's about values. The people who live in smaller areas, rural areas, suburbs, some of these declining areas, they aren't as mobile. One, they aren't as mobile, which is important. So the ability to geographically up and move is a huge contributor to economic mobility. They're stuck. But the other thing is they tend to have more family-oriented values. They're more patriarchal. 
you know, people might think they're more backward. They're not as pro-women's rights, gay rights. They're just more family values. People who live in cities are much more open to immigration, women's rights, gay rights, much more cosmopolitan, progressive values. So I think the way that expresses itself is not, you know, Trump populism, schmopulism. This is about values and about cultural norms. And he's saying, let's go backward. And the cities are saying, let's go forward. So I think we have to grab. The thing is, though, from a public policy point of view, this is really hard. It's actually much easier to think about using the income tax or negative income tax or guaranteed basic income to adjust socioeconomic differences by class. How do you deal with spatial inequality? This is no walk in the park. Do you develop revenue sharing programs that shift money to places that are being left behind if their economies are sinking? Do you in turn support people in those places to move? What do you do? I mean, and and we aren't even having that conversation. You know, what do you do when London is on one plane and the rest of the UK is on another? What do you do when New York and San Francisco and and, and the East Coast of Sella Corridor and Los Angeles, maybe Chicago, are in one part and the other parts are falling further behind? How do you adjust for that in a way that makes economic sense? And, And boy... I just think that's where, you know, some of our mind, our great minds need to really start thinking long and hard, not only about economic division, but about geographic and spatial division. And it's a tough, I think it's one of the toughest problems we're going to confront as a society. And yet you note in the book that the greatest part of this crisis is what is unfolding in urban areas across the developing world. You had some pretty sort of staggering figures to put it into perspective, if you give me a second to pull them up here. Over the next century or two, so this is a long period of time ahead of us, but just bear with me. The world's urban population is projected to almost triple, peaking at nearly 10 billion or 85 percent of a total global population of between 11 and 12 billion people. And here's the key figure. 8.6 billion of those urbanites will live in cities of the developing world, many of which have yet to be built, while just 1.2 billion or so will occupy the cities of the advanced nations. You know, as I, I point out, we have assumed that because of the experience of the West, United Kingdom, United States, the rest of Europe, advanced parts of Asia, we have assumed that urbanization and industrialization go together to produce a middle class. Yeah, it worked great for us, but it's not working for them. There are parts, like China is developing a middle class, but there are whole parts of Southeast Asia and the rest of the world where, quite puzzlingly for many economists, we are seeing urbanization without growth. We're seeing people flood off the farms in the rural areas because there's no more opportunity, because of war and civil conflict, and flood into cities and pack themselves into global slums. And and so we're seeing urbanization without growth. We're seeing urbanization occur without the development of a middle class, without the development of pathways for, for upgrading. That's terrifying. And, and what I say in the book is I think this is the grandest of all challenges that we face. You know, we face many grand challenges, climate change, energy efficiency, poverty, mobility, civil unrest, military unrest, terrorism. But it seems to me all of those pivot around building great functional cities. Um, If you build great functional cities, you have more economic opportunity, you have less poverty. If you empower people to contribute to their neighborhoods, they pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. If you build great cities, you have greater tolerance, you have more political democracy. If you build great functional cities, believe it or not, you have less terrorism, although we tend to think of terrorism happening in the advanced world. Looking around the world, it's the places that are not failed states. It's the places that are failed cities, you know, where terrorism is, is growing like gangbusters. And, and so really, the city-building mission, and what, what's so daunting about this, I, I presented this to the United Nations, the Inter-American Development Bank. And the folks at the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington, D.C., servicing Latin America, South America, and the Caribbean just said, yeah, you know, in the United States, you guys, yourself, the folks at Brookings, Ed Glazer and Mike Porter at Harvard, you built a whole set of tools of cluster analysis and talent analysis and innovation. You can go to any mayor, any economic development organization, and they know exactly, and they've done it. They've rebuilt their city economy. We don't have that in Latin America. No mayor knows that. We don't have an economic development organization. We don't, know, we don't have rudimentary statistics. So one of the things that this, the book says is we're going to have to build. We think that this is just going to magically happen, urbanization. Doctors, we have global public health. Doctors go to medical schools. Business people go get MBAs. Engineers go to engineering school. And, and this is around the world. We have teaching hospitals and we have public health programs and engineering programs that they build a bridge. 
We don't have mayor school. We don't have city school. We don't have any of this. People, okay, I got elected mayor. Let me wing it. Okay, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll find some people. You said 10 billion people, trillions of dollars. It's like we're clueless. So one of the things we're really going to have to do is build capacity. We're going to have to build institutional capacity at the global level. We're going to have to build training certification programs. We don't have data. We don't even have data to compare cities and, and what they're doing. So the one thing I'm doing at the University of Toronto is we're hoping we're hoping to build the world's first school of cities. I don't know if I think we're going to do it. I think I think we're getting there. But the idea is we'll pool people from computer science and public health and architecture and urban planning. We have 250 people studying some kind of urbanism and build the first school of cities. And I think if we could do it, like, you know, this is how we did medical schools. One day Johns Hopkins said, we're going to start a medical school based on science. One day MIT said, we're going to start an engineering school based on science and linking engineering practice. And then others followed. But I think we need something like teaching hospitals for cities. Like, we could do something like that for cities. You know, if we could build the science and the the, the curriculum, but also the practical application, I think we could do a heck of a lot of good. And, you know, I'd foc- I, I'm trying to focus my effort, but we do need a lot more resources to make this happen. Turning back home for a minute, looking back to the UK, to London, Toronto, Vancouver, into the US more broadly, what are we to do here? The short game is this. Over the past 10 to 15 or 20 years, it wasn't the federal government that rebuilt cities. Look, I voted for the Clintons. I voted for the Obamas. They didn't help. I mean, they didn't. I'm not being honest. They didn't rebuild the cities. We didn't have, Obama couldn't even, I love Obama, but he couldn't even get an urban program passed. Who did it? Chamber of Commerce, local business organization, civic organizations, the local universities, local neighborhood groups, local poverty groups, all pooling in and saying, we want our city. We want Pittsburgh to be better. We want Detroit to be better. We want Newark, never mind New York. We, and you go to Indianapolis and Milwaukee and Columbus and Philadelphia and Detroit, and you just go, oh, my God, it worked. In 15 or 20 years, with local effort, local philanthropy, local government, local investment, they rebuilt their city. And, and now what I said is, this is what my optimism, actually taking the next step is easier. I know this sounds perplexing. Once you've developed the economy so that it's functional and creating jobs, putting equity and inclusion in there. And and so I recently talked to a great economic developer, a guy I've known for 30 years, and he said, our profession is called economic development, but we focused on economic growth, building competitive, innovative, entrepreneurial, growing our economy. We haven't focused on equity inclusion or inclusion, making sure all boats rise, making sure our economy doesn't divide. He said, that's what economic development means. He's like, and when I said this to a major conference of economic developers, I swear, I thought they were going to boo me off the stage. I thought they were going to be like, Rich lost his mind. He used to be one of us. When I said, we have to turn from winner-take-all urbanism to urbanism from all, from a divisive kind of growth to an inclusive kind of growth, the room burst out in applause. That's where the optimism comes from. and, And so what do we need to do? And, and, and here's how I think we do it. The so-called anchor institutions, the universities and medical centers, which have been so p- much critical to the urban revival, providing jobs and upgrading, the big companies, Amazon, that's an urban company in downtown Seattle, the big real estate developers, these anchor institutions that benefit so much from being in cities could take this up with local government, with local stakeholders, with lo- other local actors, local uh, labor community actors, And say this, we're not just going to provide expensive housing or good housing for our knowledge workers, not only pay them more, but in some places, like universities, provide them with affordable housing and housing allowances. We're going to build affordable housing for our workforce. We can do it. We, We want our workforce to be close. We can work with cities. Cities want us to develop more. We could trade. You know, if we want to build taller towers and increase density, okay, provide some affordable housing as part of that for workers and local residents. Um, instead of setting up private shuttle buses and a private park and a private cafeteria and a private gymnasium for the highly prized knowledge workers, make them public assets. Uh, Google's going to try to build another campus in downtown San Jose near the transit hub. 
Well, it's part of that. The city should and is negotiating for more affordable housing, more workforce housing, no shuttle buses. Let's invest in the transit hub. Let's invest in public parks. Let's invest in, in public assets that everyone can. The University of Pennsylvania and the University District Drestel in Philadelphia did this. Instead of building private bookstores and, and private university health centers, they actually built all of that for the neighborhood, and they had a program of neighborhood improvement mortgage improvement, rental supplements, upgrading those properties, a charter school in the neighborhood, a public school in the neighborhood everyone can use instead of private goods. And then finally, upgrade the service jobs. This has become my big hobby horse. We made manufacturing jobs a good job. My dad always told me the story. Rich, I got this job when I was 13. It stunk. It took nine of us to make a family wage. Grandma, grandpa, me and my six siblings. I went off, I enlisted in the Army, I came back from World War II, and my crappy job turned into a good job. We had the New Deal, we had the labor movement, we had the Wagner Act, workers got to collectively bargain and organize and form unions, we had Social Security and a social safety net. My dad said, and as a result of that, my same job in the factory turned into a family job. We could have a family, we could have you two boys, buy a house and put you through college. We did that. That wasn't that was a magic. We actually did that as a society. Enlightened capitalists, like them or not, like Lincoln Filene, the retail magnate, or Henry Ford, said we have to pay these workers more if they're going to buy the stuff. So it's going to create – it's like Keynesianism. It's just basic Keynesianism. Well, what, we have to do the same thing for the 65 million people who toil in these low-paid jobs. You, know, you mentioned how little they make, 20 grand, 25 grand, 13 grand after they pay for their housing, pittance staggering in an advanced country. We, we can do it. And the same researchers who showed that when you pay manufac- at MIT, when you pay manufacturing workers more and involve them in their jobs, they do better. They've shown that when you pay service workers in retail and hospitality and food prep, when you involve them in their work and pay them more, they use their mind, they use their creativity, they do a better job, they increase productivity, they give you better customer service. So it's a win-win-win. That's what these anchor institutions have to do. The, the anchor institutions that provide good jobs for the knowledge workers have to lead here. And they have to say, our cafe- we're not going to outsource the cafeteria job and the janitor job and the food prep job. We're going to treat that person like gold. We're going to give them a career path. And then they have to help the others and the others in the community. We need policies and programs to upgrade service jobs. How do you manage that in a time of such political intractability? How do you garner the support for that kind of change under the current regime? You're going to think I'm so silly. I think it's done. I think think we've already made the shift. And I think the way I see that is what I said. When I go around from community to community, they're already working this problem. They're already saying, we rebuilt our urban. We have a new urban crisis. It may be different in Indianapolis or Milwaukee or Newark or Cleveland than it is in New York and San Francisco, but we're going to fix it. Um, I was just talking to the woman who runs the Prudential's Corporate Social Responsibility. She's like, really interesting. I mean, actually, Newark is a really interesting test case. You know, here's Amazon. Sides, you know, Seattle's giving us a little pain in the neck. We can't get enough people. We're going to pull up and have a competition between 50 metros. Prudential stayed in, in, <laughs> stayed in Newark for over 100 years through the Newark riots, 1967, for 50 years investing in that community because place was important to it. And I said to her, you know what this is going to do for your brand? She said, well, we know. You know, what your brand in an, in an era where financial companies are just seen as so terrible, you're seen as a community builder. You know, these anchor institutions and universities now realize, not all of them, but many now realize that they're part of the problem and part of the solution. So I think it's local. I don't think it's national. I think it's city by city. The the folks who do the hard work, the economic developers, the community developers, the nonprofit agencies, the local leadership, the council, the corporate anchors, and the the nonprofit anchors are going to do this. And why I'm heartened is because they're telling me we were part. They're not saying, no, 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 push this under the rug. It's all fine. No, no, we're, we're with you, Rich. If you've had a little bit of a wake-up call, we've had the same one. We're going to do this. Is it going to happen all at once? No, but you got to look at the 20 years it took to do the urban revival. We, if, if I could say, in the, could I have imagined in the year 1997 where we'd be in 2017 in these cities? If we do half of that, for inclusion, for equity, for affordable housing, for upgrading service jobs, we'll be in a much better place. And I actually think we can do more. I really believe that we can do more. And 
part of the reason, you know, it's so funny to come full circle. The last chapter of my book, The Rise of the Creative Class, was the creative class grows up. It should grow up. It should get, you know, a lovely urban neighborhood and lovely quaint coffee shop and artisanal this and that and twee lovely this and rebuild your house. It should grow up and make a better society. This was the new leading class. I think a lot of my creative class is awfully guilty. And I think that's why in these cities there was such an overwhelming vote for Mrs. Clinton. And I think they're ready for something more. I really do. You know, again, call me naive. I, I think they're really ready to, to give back and to build a better world. Uh, not all of them, but you don't need all of them. You need a group, a leading edge group. So, so I think it's going to be. You know, it's funny. People make fun of San Francisco and New York and Boston. But I think these cities realize that they have to fix themselves. And they were electing very, you know, look at London. Look at Sada Khan. Paris with Anne Hildago, they are electing very interesting group of new mayors who are quite progressive. Uh, and, and I think out of this clash and clamor, one of the things I say that's so interesting about this new urbanization is it a city isn't a gated suburb. You know, people say, well, Soho is like a gated suburb and it's like a mall, but it's not. New York City is a very socioeconomically and uh, demographically diverse place. That plays a role in an election. So is San Francisco. So is Miami. So is Toronto. So is London. There are rich and there are poor and there are every racial category. You know, they become a contested space for politics. They get tired of being left behind. So I, I think out of this contestation, we could see, but I think it's going to be local. I, I think that where the people who are more progressive fail to, or make the wrong turn is that they see that if we just capture the presidency or the prime ministership, we'll win. I really think this is going to be built city by city, community by community. Well, our guest has been Richard Florida, an urban studies theorist, professor, and head of the Martin Prosperity Institute at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management, and author of The New Urban Crisis, How Our Cities Are Increasing Inequality, Deepening Segregation, and Failing the Middle Class, and What We Can Do About It, which we have just discussed in great detail, but there was so much that we couldn't get to, so do take a read. Richard, thanks very much for your Thank time. Thank you, and I am a proud subscriber to the Financial Times. Very glad to hear that. Thanks very much, Richard. And that's the end of my conversation with Richard Florida. Give us a call at 917-551-5012. That's plus one country code because we are in the U.S., you can email us at alphachat at ft.com. I'm on Twitter at Amy P. Keen, and Cardiff is, as always, at Cardiff Garcia. Show notes for this and all other prior episodes are at ft.com forward slash alphachat. Thanks very much for listening. We'll be back next week with an all-new episode of Alpha Chat. <laughs>